We're taking a look at the beauty of grains coming up next. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to the show. I'm standing out in a beautiful field of wheat. This wheat field is just down the river from the farm. And you know, wheat is grown all over the world. It's an important and nutritious crop. It's actually a member of the grass family, and you can see the grains forming on the ends of the, the stems here. You see, wheat in the United States is grown really two different ways. One is a winter crop, and that's what this is. It was planted last fall. And then there's one that's planted in the spring, and both are harvested either in the late, late spring or summer. And that's what we're going to talk about today in this show, grains. In fact, in a few minutes, we're gonna step into the kitchen. I'm gonna show you how to make a delicious and hearty chicken dish using rice, another important grain. And then a little later, a friend of mine is stopping by to sweeten our palates with this tasty bread pudding recipe. You won't want to miss that. And don't worry, I haven't forgotten about those of you who have become gluten sensitive. And wait till you see these macarons, a true French delight that you can make yourself, that is, if you have the patience, and a tablescape featuring today's star of the show, Grain. Well, as you can see, we have a lot in today's show, so let's get started with one of my favorite grains, rice. Come on. I don't know about you, but I love rice. And I think one of the reasons I love it so much is that my family and a lot of friends uh, farmed rice in the Arkansas Delta. So we had it a lot growing up and I still love it to this day. Now what I wanna do is show you a, a, a very simple recipe using chicken and rice. And we're gonna start with the rice. The chicken dish has sort of an Asian uh, flavor to it, which really gives it quite a punch. Now what I'm doing here is I'm taking a cup and a half of short white grained rice, and I've rinsed it. I got all the rice flour off of it. Just simply rinse it over there in the sink. Now what I'm gonna do is add some water. And what I wanna do is put about an inch of water above the rice. And I'm gonna put this on medium heat. And I'm gonna let that cook down to where half this water is gone. We'll get that going right now. Okay, now let's get started on the chicken. What I have here is a pound of boneless, skinless chicken thighs, and I've cut them into bite-sized pieces. And I'm gonna mix all these ingredients together, and I'm gonna start with some light soy sauce. I'm using one tablespoon of that, two teaspoons of dark soy sauce, and two teaspoons of dry white sherry. Mm, I wish you could smell this, it smells really good. All right, I'm gonna mix that around, and then I'm gonna go for one teaspoon of salt, and two teaspoons of cornstarch. Our only dry ingredient there. Let's make a nice thickener. And then the last ingredient is some sesame oil, and I have two teaspoons of sesame oil. Now you wanna make sure that this is all mixed thoroughly. Then I'm gonna add a little cracked pepper. Love lots of pepper. And now I'm gonna add two teaspoons of peanut oil. That's getting good and hot. Got it on medium heat. Okay, now it's time to add this chicken. All 
Okay, our rice, water's boiled down now. Half of that water's gone, so I'm gonna put it on the lid and turn it on low. Because the chicken pieces are small, this cooks very quickly. The aroma is wonderful. I want to take the chicken. Rice isn't quite finished. I want to take all of this and put it right over the rice. And it will continue to cook as the rice cooks. And these lovely flavors will infuse the rice. Just cover this up. And this will be ready to serve in about 15 minutes. While this show is all about grains, I didn't want to leave out those who have gluten intolerance or have decided to go on a gluten-free diet. You see, gluten is the protein part of wheat, rye, barley, and other related grains. Some people can't tolerate gluten when it comes in contact with the small intestine. This condition is known as celiac disease. There's a common misconception that celiac disease is simply a food allergy. Ask Dr. Jeremy Bufford of the Arkansas Children's Hospital to explain the difference in celiac disease and common food allergies such as oral allergy syndrome. My name is Jeremy Bufford and I am a pediatric allergist at uh, Arkansas Children's Hospital. So the most common food allergens are to milk, egg, wheat, soy, peanuts or tree nuts, fish and shellfish. And there are major allergen proteins in these foods that the body develops an abnormal immunologic response to. There are uh, skin testing procedures that can be done or blood testing and these uh, test procedures look specifically for the uh, IgE antibody uh, to food proteins. Patients with oral allergy syndrome can usually tolerate these uh, fruits and vegetables in their cooked form because the cooking process breaks down or denatures the protein uh, so that it is not recognized by the body. Someone with uh, food allergy needs to be very cautious about the food they put into their body. We caution patients to read labels very carefully uh, in the grocery store to make sure they're not including a food in their diet that they uh, have an allergy to. Now if you're looking for something that's gluten-free, that's a tasty pastry, and pardon my little play with words, I want you to meet my friends Mary Jo and Claire. They've got something just for you. The correct way to say macaron is macaron, like macaroni. It's not a macaroon. It's a macaron. But really the correct way to say it is macaron. The French. The French way. During our research uh, for the cookie and as we began to make them, we realized that they were gluten free. I'm a nurse and so I've dealt with patients that have a gluten intolerance and that ranges anywhere from um, just GI discomfort to full-blown celiac disease, which can you know, be very life-altering. So once we realized that the macaron was gluten-free, we decided to make the commitment to research the fillings that we use and make sure that they're gluten-free as well. You um, start with your almond flour, and it, it is a nut, so you want to make sure that it's really uh, blended well. So we throw it in the food processor along with the confectioner's sugar, and we blend it. Then we sift it twice to make sure that we get all the bits and pieces of the almond out of the flour, because you want a really smooth top that's not grainy. Once you've completed that process, you go to the meringue phase. You take your aged egg whites and you um, add sugar to it to make a beautiful uh, French meringue. It'll be have a, a stiff peak. It looks like a bird beak and it'll be shiny and glossy. And as you go towards the stiff peak, you can add your color. You can use a variety of colors. You can use dried coloring. We prefer the liquid gel, but you can also get a, a really thick gel coloring. 
then you come to the most crucial phase of the whole process. That's where you add the meringue to the almond flour. And it's called a macronaging process. You have to do it by hand because there's a lot of feel that goes into it. So you blend your almond flour well with the meringue. You don't be, you're not easy like we're taught to fold in for a souffle. You're, you want to beat down the meringue just a little bit. When it begins to flow like lava or it looks like a ribbon, you add it to your pastry bag and you pipe out um, the batter onto the cookie sheet. And then after you pipe them, you let them sit for a minimum of 30 minutes to form a crust. And that's what will help uh, with the pretty foot that you see on the macaron. And you bake it for five minutes, and then you turn it, and you bake it for another four to five minutes. You can't bake too many at a time in the oven because they do uh, give off the moisture as they bake. So if you, you can only do one sheet, even at a and a big commercial convection oven, you have to be very careful. They do not like humidity at all. All right, this is my favorite part, and it's the fillings. And you can use a multitude of different fillings. Um, it's gotta be a certain viscosity, though, so it doesn't run all over the bottom of the macaron. It's got to stay good and solid in there. And we use curds from Wales and ganaches and, um, buttercreams. This is a buttercream that I'm using. It's an orange buttercream that's been in my family for quite a long time. One of our favorites. And we have baked the cookies, of course, on parchment. And you, you pipe the size of a dime right in the middle, just like that. I'm making a toffee one, and we're filling it with a dolce de leche chocolate toffee filling from Argentina, and then we roll it in the toffee bits. And to do that, you want to overfill the macaron just a bit so that there's enough chocolate around the edges to, for the toffee to stick to. All right, but the best part is we get to eat now. You really should wait for 24 hours to let the macaron mature, but we never do. Here, cheers. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. It's delicious. You need to try it. You know, when you're having people over, it helps to be organized. And I've learned this over the years, that there's so many things that you can do ahead of time. So if I'm gonna have guests over for a meal of chicken and rice or whatever, then I'd like to get my tablescape done the day before. And this is always easy to do when you're using things that aren't perishable. For instance, take a look at what I've come up with here. In the center, we've got a big bowl of those Granny Smith apples. That's in a handmade bowl that I found in Colorado. I just love it. So it's the centerpiece, but it's flanked by these large bundles of wheat that have been tinted green. So the color theme here is largely green, but with a couple of accents. The color brown that you see in the napkins, and also a touch of purple, as you see in the plate, as well as in the placemat. Obviously, these aren't the colors that we typically think of when we think of a harvest, but the table certainly does have the feeling of abundance, and that's what I wanted to create here. You know, I like to set a table for six people because it's the perfect number. Everyone can have a conversation with, with one another. Of course, I know these wheat bundles are large, but they can be removed before everybody takes a seat at the table. But for initial impact, they've got the wow factor going. So uh, you want me to just cut these in like little one inch cubes? Yeah, you want one inch cubes and I kind of like the baguettes because the, the baguettes have a little bit more crust to them. Yeah, they do. And it kind of gives it a little bit more of a, a firm feel to it. I'm going to go ahead and crack the eggs. Okay, very good. I'm with my friend Jeff Clothier who has agreed to give me and you one of my favorite recipes, his bread pudding recipe. Uh, Jeff, when did you, ah! there goes that egg jumping in there. <laughs> when did you first learn to, to cook? Have you always been interested in cooking? Yeah, I, uh, when I was in high school, actually I guess I was about 12 or 13, my mother uh, had to go in the hospital for an operation and 
so that left my dad in the kitchen. Uh oh. And, yeah. And so I got <laughs> interested in cooking after that. Oh, did you really? Yeah. He he uh, he was he was kitchen challenged. But, uh, and so ever since then, you've been you've been interested in all things that uh, come out of the kitchen. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I particularly like. Uh, um, Mexican food, you know, Tex-Mex kind of stuff. But sure. Also like, now you're originally from Texas. Yeah, yeah, up, up around Jimmy Dean country. Now, you know, one of the things about this bread pudding recipe, um, well, I guess all bread pudding recipes, is one of those classic sort of um, sweep the floor, what do I have on hand, mm -hmm. let's not let anything go bad kind of recipes. Right. Where you've got eggs, you've got cream, you've got uh, things that are perishable and you can combine them with, in this case, bread, mm -hmm. and you turn it into something delectable, particularly this recipe. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, now this is this is a fun one to make. I usually make it around Christmas each year. That's when I've had it. Yeah. But it's good any time of year. That's right, that's <laughs> right. Uh, so um, I've taken uh, one baguette here, Jeff, and I've got half of it cut into these little one-inch cubes. What do you think so far? That looks good. Okay. And how about how many cups of, of this cubed bread do we end up with? You end up with about six cut cups with the, uh, one baguette, you know, just a just a regular grocery store baguette. Now, I've, I've done it with, you know, sourdough bread. Some people like sourdough bread. Mm -hmm. It's got a nice chew to it. Yep, yep. But... Uh, and this this works if your baguette happens to be a little old. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Even in the fact, better. That's even better. Yeah. 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 I've been known to to pop them in the oven to to do that. Soften them up a little bit. Now, let's talk about what you're doing. You've taken some of our eggs from right. the, from the girls here. You know, we have all these different breeds of heritage poultry. So no, no tell them what breed of egg you you use there <laughs> in that. I'm sure it's a southern egg. I'm sure it is. Probably a silver laced wine dot. Yeah. They seem to be one of the farm favorites. <laughs> and and what are you? You used how many eggs? Four eggs. I used four eggs, and then uh, I used a cup of uh, brown sugar, uh, uh, half a teaspoon of cinnamon, a healthy pinch of nutmeg, and a tablespoon of uh, uh, vanilla. Now you're extract. you're pouring cream in there, and you're yeah. not using a measuring cup. So. Well, that's because it's a quarter cream, ah. and so we we uh, you can buy a quarter cream. It's four cups. Yeah, yeah. Some some people feel like too much cream is a bad thing, but not not around the holidays. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> the more, the better. That's right. That's Gosh, right. that looks delicious, just in that state. What a beautiful color. Yeah, it's. Yeah, and then uh, I think we can probably just uh, fold in the. Uh, so, so we're ready for the bread. Yeah. Okay. okay so here, I'm here, here that. we go with our four, or actually our six cups of, of bread. Right. Cubed. All right. There you go. That's the okay. last bit. Then we're just gonna get it all into the party, all into the pool. Okay. You want that bread to soak up every oh, bit of absolutely. that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, and the, that's why I like the, uh, the crusty breads a little bit more. You feel like it gives the bread pudding more texture? Yeah, I really, I really do. I think it, it, uh, and it whenever it rises, it, it stays up a little bit better than uh, some of the others. So we're actually going to put this in this three-quart baking dish. Right. Yeah. Okay. We think it's all going to fit. We think it's all going <laughs> to fit. I have a feeling it will. You want to put this in the refrigerator for couple of hours at least, at least, ideally overnight. Okay, all right, now we've got one that we started here. Right. So that one's been in there for um, probably about three or four hours. All yeah. Right. And you can see that it's it, it has, it looks like you've got a little rise there. Yeah, and you can see it's really soaked up the custard mm -hmm. quite well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still. So to use your phrase, you're, you're getting some of those other bits back into the party. That's right, <laughs> that's right. Mm -hmm. that Everybody swims in this party. Floated to the top there, very good. And then I uh, have the pralines, and this is, I usually. I, that's a secret weapon. Yeah, that's the secret <laughs> weapon. And, and these, you know, some people make their pralines in big dots. I usually just uh, make one big batch in a uh, uh, cookie sheet, on a cookie sheet that's oh, got a lip to it. And then they're a little bit thicker because what will happen is whenever this is in the, in the, the custard, these will dissolve a little bit. Mm. And so, but I, I like to have the kind of the, the texture. And that's two cups of those. Two cups. 
And boy, you can really taste the flavor of the molasses coming yeah. through in those pralines. Yeah. Mm, uh, so good. Some people, you know, want to have it with just uh, um, light um, brown sugar when they make their pralines. I usually use a pound of each, light and a pound and of dark. dark. Yeah. yeah. And and if someone I've is in it. a hurry and they don't have the time to make the the, the pralines. Uh, they can just use a store-bought praline. Yeah, you can. They're they're pretty common nowadays. You can you can get them at, at most. You don't have to go all the way to New Orleans to get some. No, no, no. I would say just call me, but uh, <laughs> kind of you could whip up a batch. Yeah, I'm I'm busy here okay, lately. Here we go. All right. And the, and we we did nothing to the pan. No, no nah. sort of butter or. I've tried I've tried that, and I don't really think it releases any better. Okay. All so. right. Oh, there's a few more little stragglers. Little bits. Let me get all of them. Yeah. Very good. Here we go. Last ones. Okay, right. guys. There they go. So they're they're uh, all I'm, in the party now. Yeah. Okay. And I'm going to make sure that they're some of these crawling pieces are equally distributed. Here we go. Okay. All right. Now, uh, then this will go into a 350 degree oven. I think we're all ready for you over there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Here we go. And, and how long do you bake it? Well, you know. <laughs> this is one of those look, look and see sort of things. You bake? look and see and yeah. do the jiggle. It takes about an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now we're, we're going to do the sauce while that cooks because, my gosh, the sauce is so yummy. I've got to see how you do this. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit different every year, to be honest <laughs> with you. Well, every time I've had it, it's very good. <laughs> so um, you're firing up the stove. Firing up the stove down to about medium. Okay. It's always always a little dicey to use somebody else's uh, stove. Well, you're doing a great job. Yeah. Right. Uh, got a half a stick of butter. Okay. Uh, let's see. We may have to you may dish do this out. There, we, there go. we go. All right. So half a stick of butter, salted or unsalted? This is unsalted, but I don't really think it matters. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that makes it easy. Yeah. Now we're going to put in about a cup of the the uh, uh, confectionery sugar. Okay. And it looks like it. Is not going to. And then and you, about you, a quarter cup of uh, cream. All right. And then the the, the cream makes an, another entrance onto the stage. Oh, all, always, always cream and <laughs> butter, cream and butter. You there's there's not too many dishes you can't make better with cream <laughs> butter or chocolate. I agree. I agree. Yeah. And this is uh, about a quarter cup of uh, uh, bourbon or whiskey. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, and that's mm. gonna that's gonna yeah we're gonna let it cook a little bit. It will cook down and and get nice and smooth. Um, you can see the sugar is dissolving nicely mm -hmm. now. So Jeff, how long should I continue to stir? What does it have a certain look? Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna get a little bit thick. Um, you know, it's it's. It's somewhere between a, a glaze and a, a sauce, really. So at this um, point, it's sort of up to you, but you, what do you think? At least five minutes at medium heat? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see this a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, if you, you you take a taste, and if it's where you want it, that's the, then you're there. If you uh, want to add some more of the confectionery sugar, you can do that. And more cream, whatever <laughs> you think, uh, uh, whatever floats your boat. Now, when I've had this, I've had the um, bread pudding served warm mm -hmm. and your sauce warm. Mm -hmm. Is that the way you typically recommend it be served? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the nice thing about this recipe is that, uh, yeah, it'll reheat nicely. Yeah. You know, it actually, you know, it'll, when it cools down, it'll, it'll uh, collapse a little bit, but whenever you reheat it, it'll puff back up. Now, if you think about the holidays, this, this is a dessert that you can actually make well ahead of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it comes in handy. Jeff, thanks so much for sharing sure. this with me. My pleasure. It was a lot of fun. It's really great. You know, there's something just so abundant about seeing this gorgeous field of wheat. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. Hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have, and I hope you'll give some of those recipes a try. I think you'll like them very much. Until next time, good eating and good health.